Renee. Mm -hmm. Do you TikTok? Do I TikTok? Do you TikTok? I just recently began to go on TikTok. Someone enticed mm -hmm. me to check it out, mm -hmm. and I watch. I like mm -hmm. to watch. You like to watch them. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't uploaded any videos. Okay, Adam. What about you? Do you TikTok? The only TikTok I've seen is of my wife and my daughter doing all the dance routines and uploading those because they have a great time. <laughs> no, so really? I've never actually seen them, but I see them doing them, yeah. That's fantastic. Then I've got to know their handle because I want to see them because <laughs> I, I do the dance routines all the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> David, obviously you like TikTok. I get texts from you at some ungodly hour at night and you're three hours ahead of me and you're like, I'm on TikTok. I know, I know, I'm sorry, I am. But the thing that I discovered is there's a, a whole world of food out there in TikTok land that is different from other platforms. Mm. Like, for example, I was scrolling through food TikTok, that's what they call it, food TikTok, and there's like men without shirts TikTok, and there's <laughs> gymnastic TikTok, and you know, all kinds of TikToks out there. And there was this beautiful woman with big eyes and long dark hair and she was close up to the camera and her name was the pasta queen and she was mm. holding up a tray of Sicilian cannoli and then she had this wicked big hair toss and she said ingredients <laughs> and I immediately just fell for her. Of course and you that, did. Finally someone with a flair for drama just like you. Exactly. A drama queen just like moi. And that's why this woman has 1.2 million followers and she gained them in just five months. Mm. And I watched all of Nadia Katarina Muno's TikToks that night, that's her name. And I sent her a DM on Instagram telling her that she had to be on the show. And she wrote back within minutes saying, let's do it. So this is the first time ever two queens will be on the show at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> hey, what about me? Well, you're a princess. We're going to talk about that later. All right. I'm Renee Shetler, editor-in-chief of the website Leet's Culinaria. And I'm David Leet, its founder. And this is Talking With My Mouthful, a podcast devoted to all things food, the people who make it, and the stories that make the people. Welcome to the show, Your Highness. Welcome, Nadia. Hi, guys. Hi, Renee. I feel like I should maybe curtsy. Yes, I feel like I should bow or something. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of your highness, you know, it's very funny that you're called the pasta queen because your family really is pasta royalty. They have this very long history with pasta. So can you talk to us about that? Absolutely. So I think I was uh, born into a dynasty, as you want to call it, mm. because um, I, f I felt that it was very fitting of me to be called the pasta queen because of the heritage and the heavy history in the pasta industries in the center south of Italy. So my great great grandparents in the 1800s, around 1816, 1817, started mm -hmm. off a pasta factory down about 20 minutes from Gragnano, which is a little town in the province of Naples. Mm -hmm. And that's where all the biggest pasta manufacturing companies are nowadays. But at the time, it was just starting. I mean, you can imagine it was much smaller than it is now. The demand was, um, you know, much less than it is nowadays. And so what they were doing, um, they were getting all the farmers and the landlords in, mm -hmm. in the nearby lands uh, to also provide and give the wheat and the crops mm. and provide the extra wheat they had. So my family not only owned the pasta factory, but then the wheat was so much that then they would also provide Gragnano with some of the wheat because it was overflowing. So mm -hmm. uh, they had it for quite a few generations. They shut it down right at the beginning of the Second World War. Depression hit. I mean, it was there was a lot of bombing, especially in that area. Uh, oh, yeah. So all of my family, they had a um, a cantina, which is basically a, an underground cave, where we now keep the wine and the food and mm -hmm. all sorts yeah. of goodies. But at the time, it was built as a shelter, as a bomb shelter. So. Mm -hmm. 
I, to this day, me and my brother go down there and it's a little bit creepy, but it's also kind of cool <laughs> because we keep finding things from back then. And um, yeah, but basically the pasta factory was put on pause. And then after that, uh, my family just carried on as landlords, uh, providing all the goods, including wine, mm -hmm. produce, wheat to the local agricultural consortium. And you were called the macaronis, right? Actually, uh, still today, when they see us on the street, they're like, oh, macaroni, because <laughs> it's just uh, one of those surnames that was given to us because of the fact that we used to lay uh, miles of pasta to dry. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. the estate is still the same estate. It was passed mm -hmm. down. So the pasta factory virtually was at the location where my family now lives. Well, and what about actually making pasta at home, not in the factory? Do you have any of your earliest memories yes. of pasta making? Yes, 100%. I think the earliest one I can remember myself was when I was five and I was making gnocchi and fettuccine with my grandma Caterina. She's the one that was in our family, the most popular and most talented cook. And she could mm -hmm. do pretty much anything. Mm. She would be like making the tomato sauces and making the wine, grinding the wheat. Wow. Yeah, butchering meat. I mean, she was very, very talented and very skilled in all sorts of food prepping. So you came to the States... Food has always been part of your life, your story, your passion. Where did work and food connect? When did you start doing the videos? So I'm like a party animal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no kidding. I don't know if you can tell by my TikToks. Yeah, little obvious. Yeah, never would have guessed. Never would have <laughs> little guessed. Little obvious. So I was constantly trying to do food, uh, whether events or company events, uh, friends, hosting someone else's fundraisers at my place, right? I have a very mm -hmm. large home here in, in Florida. It's uh, almost 8,000 square feet, so it's perfect for parties. Wow. Yeah, wow. it's wonderful. I have about an acre of land. It's really beautiful, massive gardens. The kitchen is, I made it so that I could be a hostess and hold large, amazing Italian parties. Yes, that's very clear from the TikTok. Yeah, so basically I, I started doing that more and more and then I was like, oh my God, I wish I could do this full time. It was when lockdown hit that I mm -hmm. went into it with the intention of doing it. And it was the first time I actually was like, I'm going to do this, I'm locked in my house, my company right. is at a st <laughs> on standby. There was nothing mm -hmm. better to do, really. I mean, we couldn't right. go outside much. We couldn't mingle with friends. Mm -hmm. So I had a lot of time on my hands and I felt it was okay to put the company on pause because it was basically forced on us, right? Right, Absolutely. it was, all of us. Exactly, we were all forced. So mm. I was extremely happy to just be cooking in my kitchen. And me and my brother and my cousin just started filming and we still to this day use our iPhone. Right. Um, and we just make these TikToks where it's super fast. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it was about mid-March when we got told, okay, that's it, lockdown is happening, it's mandatory. And it got really serious. So mm -hmm. at that point I started posting regularly. It was about March. I was posting at least once a day. Wow. And I know, and I started doing all of my favorite recipes first. One of the things that's so surprising to me is that even though these videos are less than a minute long, you were actually teaching people mm -hmm. how to cook. Yes. That's amazing. How hard is that? I find it extremely easy. How so? How so? Okay, so first of all, I love talking. <laughs> I really do. Really? I, I, could talk, I, oh I never God. knew that. I could talk for hours <laughs> and hours. And so for, for 
for me, when I do a YouTube, I get a little bit sidetracked because- Yeah, but your YouTubes are absolutely hysterical. Okay, they good. They really are. I mean, the yeah. mistakes that happen and the joking that happens between yeah. you and your brother, I'll go, it's so funny. And it's great to go to YouTube from your TikTok because on TikTok where I discovered you, like I left wanting more. Exactly. Right? Not the recipes, like I could understand, which as David said, that there's an artistry to that. Yeah. Yes. But just your personality. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you, guys. I really appreciate it. And love you, Beck. Um, <laughs> I'm feeling it. I'm feeling it. Yeah, so, good. Feel the love. I love the fact that I can create a little bit of a different type of content for each platform. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I love Instagram because a lot of the times you'll see my stories and I put like little bloopers behind the scenes. Yes. Yep. And... I am actually about to upload something really, really funny that my brother did when he was making whipped cream. Oh my God. And, uh, <laughs> but I really love giving a little bit of a more down to earth Nadia behind the scenes. Okay. On TikTok, you'll see a really dramatic pasta queen. Yes, oh, when did the hair flip start? Yes. I love the hair flip. So I am a lover of uh, telenovelas mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and drama, twists and plots, suspenseful mm-hmm. moments. That's clear. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. I love yeah, it. Absolutely. Like That's my preference. When I'm watching something on TV or Netflix or whatever on the, at the cinemas, I'm mm-hmm. looking for suspense, drama, Plots, mm-hmm. twist, and I wanted to accentuate that part of myself, and I wanted everybody to know that that's what I love the most. I love that about myself. I am actually very flamboyant and loud, and <laughs> obviously I don't go around flipping my hair at every turn. Right, of course. <laughs> but in my mind, I dream in telenovelas. Mm. <laughs> That's a great line. I dream in telenovelas. Yes. Just a little bit I, more embellishment to everything. Yes. And it's, everything is kind of like a little more dramatic. And mm-hmm. and I love how Ago is in the back. And when you do the hair, he flies. Cracks yeah. me up every single time I see that. Cracks so me up. So he's, he's got a real true Italian dry humor. Mm-hmm. And sometimes where where we're from, Rome... They're very aggressive, antagonistic people. Mm. Mm. So when someone is trying to show off or uh, is trying to look cool and boast a little and brag, usually you have the Roman humor is to put them down somehow, but in a funny way, not too, it's Mm -hmm. not mean, but it's kind of mean. It's like like a New Yorker, you know? They're kind of mean, but in a fun way. Snarky. Snarky. Yeah, they're they're snarky. Calling them out. Yeah, calling them out. So... I love the fact that he's always done that with me. I've always been like really um, rambunctious and in shoes, you know, in Sushan and dramatic ever since I was a kid. And he's always like, come on, really? Will you stop it? And, right. and it's like he brings me down to earth a little mm-hmm. while I have mm-hmm. my heads in the cloud. He's like, he brings me down and he makes me... Human. <laughs> yeah. Well, I imagine if that makes any sense. It does, and it's a great combination. Yeah, and I love him, and he's my brother, and we're only one year apart. We're basically, you know, twins. Mm-hmm. We've we've gone through uh, childhood together. We've experienced a lot together, and grown up together. And we love the same music. We love cooking. He's worked in restaurants for many years. So he's even more obsessed with me, with right. recipes and the way of cooking in Italy and the Italian cuisine. And Anyway, so we're basically a great team. And also, my cousin is an actual chef. So that's just, oh, okay. you know, that's mm-hmm. even, that's, that's another added bonus to the family. So what are some of the favorite recipes that you've made for TikTok, both your own as well as the ones that you hear feedback on? So I loved uh, my pasta with peas. I -hmm. don't usually uh, like peas that are are mushy or made into Mm -hmm. like a cream. 
However, sure. the way I make it, and that is like a very old recipe, by the way, um, when I mix the cheeses with the egg and then I mix it all in with the cream of peas, yeah. it's really something else. You guys really need to try that recipe. It's delicious. I love okay. that recipe a lot. And actually, it was one of Kylie Jenner's favorites. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, my. That, that and the lemon pasta. That's the one that I like. Yeah. I've made that one, and that's a very good pasta. So I haven't told many people this, but I'm going to tell you. because oh, tell me, Karina. Yeah, right, because you guys tell are really, me. really into the cooking and... Um, but that recipe is a Sophia Lorenz recipe. The lemon. Is it really? Yes. Wow. And a lot of the Italians um, have come out saying, oh, I've never seen that recipe. I got pasta uh, makers contacting me saying, wow, we love this recipe. What well, We've always made it um, dairy-free because that's the original mm. classic Amalfi recipe. It's only garlic, extra virgin olive oil, the zest and the juice of a lemon. That's it. Oh, okay. And they usually use a pasta called tagliolini, which is mm -hmm. a very thin fettuccine or tagliatelle. Mm -hmm. Now, that one that I love so much is actually a Sofia Lorenz recipe, and you can find it in our latest uh, cookbook. It's called okay. like Sofia Loren Memories and Recipes, something like that. First of all, I love Sophia Loren. Mm -hmm. Who doesn't? Exactly. We were both born in Rome and both mm -hmm. raised in the south of Italy. Mm -hmm. She's from Pozzuoli, like literally 20 minutes away from where I was raised down south. Mm -hmm. But she was also born in Rome, just like me. I have several of her recipe books, and not many people know that she has recipe books. I didn't know. Did you know, Renee? And she's a terrific cook. Exactly. Yeah, yeah you know, I didn't. There you go. So not many people know this. So mm -mm. I actually have collected a few, some old ones from Italy, and then I found this one here in the U.S. that she had translated for uh, her U.S. audience. But pretty much every single recipe in that cookbook is a staple in my family. It's a staple recipe really? in my family, yes, because we're from the same area, so mm -hmm. the way she mm -hmm. cooks is the way that my family sure. cooks. It makes sense. Of course, yeah. Exactly. So, and she also, because she's smart, has adapted some of the recipes and added a few ingredients to appeal to the U.S. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For example, I believe that the addition of uh, whipped cream or heavy cream, mm -hmm. heavy whipping cream mm -hmm. to the pasta limone that I made is her own addition because she was in the U.S. and she knows how much the Americans love cream. We love our cream. Yeah. We yeah. love it. So I follow the recipe to the letter and it was one of the most successful recipes I have on TikTok and Instagram mm. actually. Yeah, it's great. Let's talk about carbonara because there's a lot of misconceptions about carbonara. And I love when you and your father or you and Ago look at other people making pasta. That yes. absolutely cracks me up. Oh, my God. Cracks me up. But please tell our audience the proper way to make carbonara. Yes. So carbonara, I'm going to, you know, this disrupt or destroy a mess which yeah. is it doesn't have any cream in it. Thank you very much. It doesn't have any onions. It doesn't have any garlic. Mm -mm. Nope. It's it the mo one of the most simple recipe because it was born um, at a period or in a period where there was l little resources. There wasn't mm -hmm. fancy food. We'd just come mm -hmm. out of the war. Okay, so there's no trace of carbonara as we know it right now before the 1940s in Italy. That's fascinating. Yes. So it is said that it is an adaptation of an old recipe which had egg and cheese, uovo e cacio, it's called. It was an old recipe of people that used to be uh, farmers, landowners, mm -hmm. they had eggs, mm -hmm. they had cheese. Those are the two right. things that you find in any farm, don't you? 
So yes, those exactly. are the things that is very easy for anybody to make and throw together. You know, a scrunch of pepper. Yes. Right? A scrunch of pepper. But I love that. A scrunch. <laughs> I, I'm Just sorry, a scrunch. I adore her. A scrunch of pepper. Exactly. So listen to David's this story. David's getting red in the face, which means he's very excited he's, and very enamored. Oh my God, David, <laughs> you're so sweet. Stop <laughs> it. Stop <laughs> it. <laughs> okay, so listen to this. So in the 1940s, mm. uh, you know that the Americans came over and kind of saved our butt. Mm. They, saved, they saved us. I, yeah. I, that's why the Italians love Americans, by the way. They brought mm. a whole new wave of cool and fancy and Hollywood and this and the other. And everybody is in love with America ever since then. Mm -hmm. Now, you know that obviously the American soldiers, as to this day, loves eggs and bacon for breakfast. Yes. So... It wasn't popular to use bacon in the dishes at that time. But mm -hmm. it is a version of the story that the Italians, specifically in the region of Lazio, in Rome, wanted to appease the American soldiers. And so mm -hmm. they created this recipe and added to the old fashion recipe, which was just egg and cheese, and mm -hmm. stuck in it a little bacon, which is, uh, we used guanciale, you know? Mm -hmm. It's yeah, a... Bravo. It's a, it's a type of uh, bacon. It's a pork cheek. Yeah, it's a pork yeah. cheek. That's guancia yeah. means cheek. Mm -hmm. Guanciale. So we use that. And some people use pancetta, which is the little tummy of the pig. Mm -hmm. But really, the classic recipe that has been developed is the cheek. And the name is said to be taken by, you know, the secret society called the Carbonari. It's a secret society of Italy. And mm -hmm. uh, at the time, they played a big role as well in the liberation. So it's, there's a lot of versions to this story, but I have looked into it very thoroughly and I feel that this is actually how it came about because I went to see very old cookbooks. There is no record of carbonara before the Second World War in the Italy. The war, yep. Yeah. That's what my research did too. So let's four people, so they actually know, what are the four or five ingredients in carbonara? So you've got guanciale, the chick of the pig, mm -hmm. You got pecorino romano, which is mm -hmm. a type of cheese that is a sheep cheese. Sheep's so cheese. Sheep's mm -hmm. cheese, so it's lactose free, okay? Mm -hmm. And fully. And then uh, you've got eggs, and you've got a scrunch of pepper. That's it. That's it. You've got Simple. four ingredients, and you've got the mm -hmm. pasta of your choice. And the pasta, which is the five. Now, and that's what I do. That's all I do. That's all you do. In Rome, it's very popular to make carbonara with rigatoni or spaghetti. Mm -hmm. Yeah, spaghetti. Exactly. Mm -hmm. It's very That's simple. It. Good. I'm glad we finally cleared that up for all our listeners. <laughs> because yes. people really, I love carbonara. It's one of my favorite pastas. I make it all the time. And I see these things where there's cream, there's peas, there's onions, there's garlic. There's all these things put in it. And that is not carbonara. No. I mean, anybody can experiment with foods and there's a lot of things that I see that as food experimenting. But then if you're doing a classic, you need to stick to the classic. Thank I you. I agree. I agree. All right. So carbonara plus everything else, how much pasta would you say you go through a week? Oh. Not just for personal cooking, but for the videos. Everything. Probably three or four kilos, which is... Nice. Um, yeah, like double, a little bit more like than double pounds. in pounds. More than double. Yeah. yeah. That's a lot of pasta. That's a proper Italian household. That yeah, is. but also it's it's about 10 of us, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and so is your pasta a primi or is it just that's what you have for your meal? So it's a, definitely only a primi unless you're mm -hmm. making a, a plate of pasta that is basically a complete meal, such as, mm -hmm. for example, a lasagna. Which is very mm. filling, and you've got you got cheese, and you've got the meat, and you've got mm -hmm. the carbs. It's more of a complete meal. But if you mm. have like a very light aglio olio or pasta al pomodoro, 
or something very light, then you would have a little bit of veggies on the side, maybe a salad, some grilled zucchini or eggplants, and maybe a little bit of an antipasti. Um, but I have to be honest, I go straight into my first meal. If I'm just doing on a day-to-day -day and I don't have guests, I just get on with the pasta and maybe I'll have a little salad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I, I eat considerably little. Well, you have to. With all the pasta that you make and to be the size that you are, you have to eat like a bird. So I have a few extra pounds that I mask and... You know, you can't see them very well because I'm not, you know, um, I'm on the rounder side, mm -hmm. <laughs> especially around my hips. So okay. the spaghetti definitely go there. You got spaghetti hips. I got spaghetti hips. And um, no, but the thing is that in Italy, generally, if you go to a restaurant, they don't do the same kind of portions uh, that no. you will find on a restaurant Correct. here in the U.S. Yes, I we agree. are generally used to eating less, smaller portions. So our listeners are incredible home cooks. Oh, yeah. And they love to get help from experts. So what are some of the few top tips you can give us for making pasta and pasta sauces? Okay, so my number one tip is to save mm -hmm. pasta water. Mm, yes. Amen. Yes, so this is a big, big trick that mm -hmm. you learn after many years of cooking or if you've worked in a restaurant, because in the restaurant they use pasta water all the time because they want to make yes. sure that the pasta is not sticky. Yeah, and, exactly. you know, they have the sauces always available and they're maybe been there for a couple of hours. So you want to loosen them up and make them more juicy. So you use a lot of pasta water. And... Um, you know, my old YouTube videos, you can see that I'm doing cache pepe, carbonara, and I'm using the pasta water and I'm ex and accentuating and highlighting the importance of pasta water. And to because this it, day, it, it, it makes the sauce. Makes the creamier. It makes the sauce, yeah. So yeah, what it does. it does, really, and I'm going to explain it really, really simple because I don't want to be like uh, an encyclopedia. <laughs> but okay. the thing is that when you cook the pasta, the mm -hmm. pasta is made out of wheat and uh, wheat has a starch in it. Starch is like a glue. All it does is, as it's cooking towards the end, the starch is being released into the water. And that's why the water goes a little bit pale. You see, right. it, it, it goes a little bit like opaque. Mm -hmm. Yes. Especially if you're using a really good quality pasta, even mm -hmm. better, it releases even more starch. Well, can we sidetrack there for a moment? Forgive me for interrupting, but what are the brands that you like best? Yeah, good question. The number one brand that I love is Gentile. Okay. Mm -hmm. You can find it in the U.S. I've been able to find it in specialty stores and a franchise called The Fresh Market. They have a few hundred locations here in the U.S. They're not as popular as Whole Foods, but you can find good pasta at Whole Foods too. Mm -hmm. slow dried at low mm. temperature and used pasta made with bronze dyes. Bronze dyes, yeah. Okay. Yeah, basically the bronze dye is it's like a mold that mm -hmm. is made out of bronze and you uh, push the pasta through it so it gives it the texture and the shape. So the bronze mm -hmm. dye comes in whatever shapes pasta you want. And the beauty of it is that the surface is so rugged and rough that mm. it helps the sauce absorb instead of or opposed to slipping away. Uh, okay. It catches it. You see, it catches Beautiful. it. Beautiful. Any other brand? Yes, like? I have a few brands. So I've got Gentile, okay. Pasta di Martino. Mm -hmm. I got Montebello, which you can get mm -hmm. on Thrive mm -hmm. Market. Thrive uh, delivers, home delivers to, you know, the entirety of the U.S. And you can find it at Whole Foods and Rustichella d'Abruzzo, which is one of the biggest ones at Whole Foods. I like that brand a lot. Yeah, all of these ones are really high quality pastas. They will perform incredibly with the sauce and they will release the exact amount of starch. When you use the pasta water, which you're supposed to collect just before draining your pasta... Because that's when it has the most amount of starch. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So then as you toss the pasta into the sauce, 
you add as, you know, uh, as much as you want pasta water. Don't go too crazy on it because you don't want mm -hmm. your pasta too watery. <laughs> but you can always save it because you just turn on the flame a little on low heat and you can cook it and smoke it away if it's too much pasta water. But add a little bit at the time. Mm -hmm. And then my second thing that I wanted to say as a ticker trip is mm -hmm. um, whatever the packaging time is on the pasta box, drain your pasta two minutes before so that it's extra al dente. Al mm -hmm. dente means that it's got a little crunch when you bite into mm -hmm. it. Right. So right. it's extra al dente and finish the cooking one minute, one minute and a half at a low heat because what happens is the pasta is still wanting to cook and it's absorbing the sauce. So the, the pasta itself will taste incredible because it's literally absorbing the sauce in order to expand mm -hmm. that extra minute. Well, Nadia, we could talk all afternoon about pasta yeah, we really and could. Italian food. Oh, I love pasta. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Molto, molto grazie. Molto yeah, grazie. You're very welcome, guys. <laughs> I really enjoyed this talk. You guys are lovely. Thank you. Thank you. I hope to do another podcast soon. And let me know uh, what the people have said. If they have any other questions, I'm willing to answer. Sure. And obviously follow me on TikTok and Instagram. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much, Your Majesty, for stopping by. You're thank very you, welcome. Grace. Bye, David and bye, Rene. Big kisses. Ciao, ciao. Ciao, ciao. Nadia Caterina Muno, a.k.a. the Pasta Queen, is TikTok famous. You can find her on TikTok and Instagram at the underscore Pasta Queen and on YouTube at the Pasta Queen. You know, Renee, all this talk about pasta is making me really hungry. Mm-hmm. Do we have anything on the site that would sate even the biggest pasta lover? Do we have anything on the site? I know. Yes. Rhetorical question. I know. Well, beginning with homemade pasta, mm -hmm. one of our most popular recipes on the site is our homemade pasta dough recipe. Yeah. And 33 readers have left a cumulative 4.9 out of 5 star rating on that. Thumbs up on that one. And isn't it like tens of thousands of people have shared and everything? Absolutely. Like literally hundreds of thousands of people come to that recipe each year. Yeah, that's great. And it actually, it takes you through everything step by step. You do need a pasta machine though, a roller. A roller, but you can do it by hand. You could, you could absolutely roll it out by hand. And we also have an easier approach. Um, this straponi recipe we just ran. David, right. I think, did you make that one? No, I didn't make that one. Well, our testers did, and they loved it. You basically take a rolling pin, you roll the dough out to about an eighth inch thickness. Mm -hmm. You kind of gently drape it over the rolling pin, and then you go to your pot of boiling water, and you just sort of rip pieces of the dough Very easy. into the water. So easy, so satisfying, so gratifying. Yeah. Now, I would imagine you want me to plug your pumpkin macaroni and cheese recipe on the site for those who don't want to make their own pasta. Well, when I sent you that note and bribe, and I said distinctly, please don't tell them. You called it a bonus. <laughs> please don't tell them. I'm asking you to plug my recipe. But yes, now that you've mentioned it, you may plug my recipe. <laughs> okay. Well, folks love that recipe too. Maybe not quite as many have people have made it yet, but we're on our way. It's rich, it's hearty, it's satisfying. We actually have dozens of pasta recipes on the site. Everything yeah. from casseroles to what to do with leftover pasta. If you've got a couple eggs, you can make a frittata. Even recipes for like that nine o'clock Tuesday night craving when all you've got in the pantry is half a box of dried pasta, a stale loaf of bread, a little olive oil, and maybe half a chili pepper. We've got you covered. That all sounds excellent. I think I'm gonna have to ask for that bribe back. <laughs> Already spent. This podcast is produced by Overt Studios and our producer is the starchy Adam Claremont. You can reach Adam <laughs> and Overt Studios at overtstudios.com. And remember to subscribe to Talking With My Mouthful wherever you download your favorite podcasts. And if you like what you hear and want to support us, consider leaving a review and rating on Apple Podcasts. And if you'd like to leave Renee and me a recorded question or compliment, visit our podcast page at leit.es forward slash chat. Press and talk away and maybe you'll be featured on the show. Ciao. Ciao. 
unique New York, unique New York, unique New York, unique New York. Steven, what are you doing? We used to do this in acting class. 